Hello. Um, I'm not Ed Malian. Uh, Ed Malian was supposed to present this today, but uh, I'm very much afraid that Ed Malian is unwell. So I will be taking over hosting duties tonight. If at any point it seems like I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, it is because I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, and that's how it's going to come across. I will be referring to notes, which looks awful, like a best man who hasn't prepared, but uh, bear with me, we're all going to get through this. So, um, to reiterate, I'm Ian McIntosh. I'm the co-author of the book Football Manager Stole My Life, which you may have seen. Melvin Bragg described it as slightly better than Anthea Turner's autobiography, but only just. Just. I'm joined by two fantastic guests today. Um, first of all, coming onto the stage is the man who propelled Football Manager from the stuffy bedroom of the Collier Brothers to its lofty perch at the top of the gaming industry. He's one of the co-founders of Games Aid. He works with Warchild, BAFTA, Nordoff Robbins and Special Effect. He's got a column in the mirror. He's got an actual bloody OBE. He's the studio director of Sports Interactive and he is Mr. Miles Jacobson. Don't clap yet because he's joined by someone just as wonderful. It's the man who turned his football manager problem into a football manager solution with the hit stand-up comedy show, Football Manager Ruined My Life, which I have seen and I can testify is absolutely brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miles Jacobson and Tony Jameson. Hello. Hello. Thanks Hello. for joining me. Hello, everyone. Hello. And thanks to everyone else for, for joining me. I, I know the weather has been appalling, and uh, it's also very difficult to log off Football Manager at any point. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Tonight we are obviously going to talk about Football Manager. We're also going to talk about stand-up comedy. But before we talk about that, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters unified in our devotion to a computer game that was once dismissed as a glorified bloody spreadsheet. But the we know to our cost is so much more. And this is a proud day for the likes of you and me. For this is a day that Football Manager has announced a groundbreaking link up with the good people at Prozone. And you may have heard about this in the news, but for more, directly from the horse's mouth, Miles, what's happened? Um, well, life imitating art, imitating life, which Kieran doesn't like me saying, but I'm, I'm going to keep saying it anyway. Um, we've been working with originally a company called Amisco, who were like Prozone, but no, no one's ever heard of them before. Um, they were a French company who provided loads of stats to clubs and kept themselves very much under the radar. And we've been working with them for a few years because we used to license their tech to help us make our match engine. Because what better way to be making the match engine better if we're actually watching real life games in 2D and 3D more graphically rather than the actual TV footage. Um, and we were getting on very well with them and then they turned around to us one day and said that they were merging with a company called Prozone, had we heard of them? And it's like, well, yeah. And they went, well, we want you to be part of it as well. And rather than um, just having their, the main product that they have, they were looking at putting together a product called Recruiter which is a scouting tool, which is with the same clubs that they provide other data to as well. And they wanted to license our data for it. And, um, and that's happened. So just to, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Recruiter is an incredibly powerful piece of software that utilizes the stats gained from games to create a kind of, uh, it, it enables you to look for players directly according to attributes. It's a bit like doing a player search in FM. You go on there as a, as a real life manager and you copy down Troy Deeney's stats and say, I want to find a player who's like Troy Deeney. Who doesn't? Yeah, exactly. And There's uh, no player like Troy well, Deeney. Well, obviously with Troy, he's irreplaceable. Of course, but, of course. But if you were doing it with, with Belkalem, who we've just loaned to a Turkish team, then you can do, you can do the same thing with him and, and find someone who, who is similar. And they've had recruiter working for a while, but they've had it from the position of previous stats so just real just real life match data but with our systems as well they've got a load more information because they they're getting injury history they're getting contract info but also how we think the players are going to do in the future um, and whereas our database is 500 and at the moment as of yesterday when I last checked with 583 thousand players and staff from around the world that's the same that QPR had when they got relegated from the <laughs> Premier League it's it that's true um, 
with Recruiter, we've got 80,000 players, but they've also got video clips in there. So it's not just the agent sending video clips. Someone can go in and do that player search and end up with a video of the player, their stats from them, their stats from us, and then decide whether they're going to send a scout to go and see them or not. It's not, it's not like that sort of that archetypal YouTube compilation, is it? Where they make it look like quite decent. They've got some heavy dance track in the background and then just ends with Jimmy Triore just falling over. And then... I, 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 was, I was asked this earlier. I, I did a few radio interviews today and I was asked that earlier and, and did point out that even though my quality is not really World Cup, it's not even good enough for Sunday League as a footballer, I'm sure someone could put a video together of me looking good. And then on the way back to the office from doing that interview, one of my mates who played, for, played with me for the Watford Internet supporters team went, no, mate, there's no chance <laughs> it would have been a video. So, so it isn't possible to make everyone look good at football in a video, but so most people, yes. The question that everyone's were going to ask, particularly people who uh, are, are a little dismissive of football manager, the bastards, is um, th is this going to replace scouting? Well, it's not going to replace scouting. It's just going to be another resource for scouts. You know, no manager should ever sign a footballer without having watched them first. I don't care if their chief scout has seen them. Spending £10 million on a footballer Alan Irvin, where you, haven't, where you haven't watched them <laughs> is, I find, a little bit strange. But... Um, but yeah, at least send the head scout out to see them. So no one should be using the data and just deciding to buy them off that. No one should do a bebe. Look what happened with him. Can we, um, can we know who's using it? What, what kind of clubs are using the software? Um, there are a lot of clubs in the Premier League and top European divisions, but Prozone keep that quite close to their chest of exactly who's using it. But a lot. It's is quite there, scary, actually, how many people are using it. Is there anywhere we can see? Maybe, maybe a screenshot, perhaps? Ah, maybe a screenshot. Here's one we prepared earlier. Um, if you go to our Facebook page, because you're not going to be able to see this properly from here, but we do have uh, some screenshots of, of what the recruiter system looks like. Unfortunately, um, the logins are really expensive, like football club expensive. So I don't expect anyone here to be to be able to get a login. I, I still want one for myself anyway. But if you go to our Facebook page, you can at least see some screenshots of it. So you've been uh, you've been all over the media today talking about this. What's the reaction been in general? To me or to the to, to the product? To, to the idea. <laughs> um, everyone's been really positive. Which a few years ago we announced that we had a deal with Everton. And we went round the media at that time, and I, I did an interview for the World Service, where the interviewer said to me, um, you know, but you're just a bunch of kids, right? You've never played football before. You've never played football at a high level, and you've got all these people around the world who are also kids who haven't played football providing all this research. So why have Everton licensed your data? You know, it's stupid, right? Because you guys don't know anything about football. To which my response was, well, that's odd, because I used to live, listen to your commentary when I was growing up, and that's how I learned quite a lot about football, at which point you just said, touche. <laughs> but I think nowadays things have changed because so many people in the media have grown up playing the game, and yourself included. Um, so I feel really old actually <laughs> saying that. I'm not that old. But, but there are lots of people in the media who've, who've grown up playing it, and loads of people who blog about football who, who've become really interested in the, st in the statistical side of the game off the back of the game. So everyone's been taking it incredibly seriously and just, yeah, well, this makes total sense to do rather than the negativity from a few years ago. Fantastic. Well, from football manager becoming more like real life to football manager ruining my life, uh, Tony, uh, as I said in the introduction, is... Uh, is a stand-up comedian who's made his name with a show about his addiction to Football Manager. Tony, you must have been terrified when you did this for the first time. You must have been, like, like me, with Football Manager Stole My Life, the book, wondering, is anyone actually going to watch this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, you've maybe slightly over-egged it there that I've made my name on this. I mean, has anyone turned up specifically to see me? 
I, I do. There you are. <laughs> yeah, I think we've just disproven that straight away. Yeah, apart from Miles, yeah. Yeah, but then, yeah, but then you've top trumped us with your whole Prozone thing. Just like, oh, we'll come and see Tony. Oh, we've got a Prozone link going on. So, you know, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, it was, it was weird to sort of come up with the idea for the show. Um, and yeah, a very sort of going, it's either going to go one way or the other. It was either going to be loads of people going to turn up or nobody was going to turn up. And it was just going to be me in a little room with my laptop, just going, please, someone come. And uh, thankfully, it worked out all right. So, we, we've uh, we've now we did the Edinburgh Festival with it last year, uh, which was lovely. And then in September, we're actually taking the show on tour. So we're going to be going around the country uh, September, October, November, and then uh, there's a little bit of a gap for January and December. And then we're coming back in February, and we're running until the end of the season. So that's so has this been, been like a kind of group counselling for people all over the country? It is absolutely it is group therapy. It's just a bunch of blow like yourselves, just all sitting there, just in the whole thing just go right this is what we're doing this is what we're doing they go just shout about Totten Zola McCorko that's all we want <laughs> for an hour and, and it's great there's the people sort of chat at the end of the show and just say oh you know I've done stuff like this or you know this is what happened to me and they've got stories and I think the way I had one when in Manchester uh, we did it and uh, a guy came up to me at the end of the show and he went what's the most you've ever made on Teddy Lucic and I just went <laughs> what <laughs> Like, because he was, he was like, I was, I never thought that was a conversation I'd have, and he was just going, I made, I made eight million, and then just walked off. <laughs> Brilliant. I had a bloke in Leicester once say that he'd, uh, he played the game because I tried to work out how long people had played the game, and he said, uh, I said, oh, how long you, you played the show at the game here, and he goes, uh, he goes, I'm five years clean. I was like, that's genius. <laughs> What's um, what, what is it about football manager that's dragged people in? Because that that is a, a standard reaction to not deem it as a computer game like Worms or Lemmings or something like that. Yeah, like showing me age. Um, <laughs> but uh, but but it has become a kind of pivotal part of people's lives. What, think, what is it about the game that's done that? I think, like you say, I think it's I think it's an age thing. I think that we've all grown up at, at the same time with it and sort of experiencing that. And because I think because of the fact that it just gives you the opportunity to do what your manager of your team is doing like everyone's the fan first and foremost and watching the game and a match just going yeah i can do better than him and then you go and you get on the on the football manager and you do it i mean i've played as villa this year and it turns out that i can do about as well as paul lambert's doing actually so he's, he's working under very hard circumstances <laughs> and uh and if anything he's working well within the wage budget he's been given so uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's that thing. I think it's that thing where you, you say you can do better and it gives you that opportunity to go, right, go on, try it and, and see what happens. And I think once you get about four or five years in, it starts to become magical. <laughs> you start to get attachment to pixels. Do, do <laughs> you feel a, a paternal love for your for your regens? Oh, I've, I get very I've got, precious. I've got, I, oh, like, you know what, right? There's, I've, I'm convinced I turned up to one of my regens' weddings. I'm genuinely <laughs> convinced. <laughs> Derek Reynolds, if you're out there, like, you, you mean the world to me. You genuinely do. Have, yeah, have you had a son in the game yet though. no i haven't I this, haven't. this is probably the question i get most asked most often on twitter is how do you get a son in the game and the answer Did is you get asked it in real life as well <laughs> not not for, that for, for those who are just playing it too much you may have missed an important step of adolescence <laughs> yeah i'm not very good at having children myself so there's kind of a, a problem there but um <laughs> but well, that was a, that was a bit of a, a dip there, wasn't it? <laughs> a problem because I'm not female. No, just, just before any other room. Miles, 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 it, does, right. it does. This is a safe your, your involvement. Your involvement, really, your involvement is going to be on the stage with a comedian. It's just not going to work. <laughs> um, but the thing is, getting a son in the game is completely and utterly random, and people just don't believe it. So we've we've got people who've said, right, so you have to be over 37, <laughs> and then you've got to have 10,000 regens coming through, and the 10,000 and that once and, and once is going to be a son it's like no it's random so it is random but you can get so a son does that mean game. that i've just had girls then maybe so okay or you've spent too long playing the game oh, but, right. but i know you're married so you know. yeah so speaking just... um <laughs> <laughs> gradually dragging us back off that tangential path <laughs> miles it's been 20 years since you've been involved in this what was your first introduction to championship manager was someone slipping you a floppy disk um, overtly? yeah it actually it, no it, it, tony it was, no well, no I, I played <laughs> a time and a place <laughs> disc tony disc um i played the first one i was a fan of the first game anyway even though it got like 20 odd percent reviews was this the very first magazines? one with no real player now? Absolutely, it was yeah. amazing. And then I was working in the music industry at the time, 
and two guys who worked at Domark, who were the publishing company at the time, wanted to go and see Blur play, who were one of the bands that I worked with. So I swapped two tickets to go and see Blur to be a beta tester on, um, on CM2. <laughs> um, and I was sending faxes through, because you know there were times before email. So I was sending faxes through to Ovan Paul, with, to Ovan Paul Collier with some suggestions, not knowing that it was genuinely two kids in their bedroom who, who when they got a fax through, were like, oh, this is a magical machine. What does this do? Um, and they liked some of my ideas. And they, they moved down to London. I met them up for a drink. And we started working together and have now worked together for 20 years, although bizarrely, even though they started the company, I actually, I've, I'm longer serving than they are because they both went traveling for periods. Paul was in a band and was on tour for, for 18 months and I've went traveling around Australia for a bit. But, um, but Woodge, Mark Woodge, who's our head of research, he's been there longer than all of us. So I'm, I'm not the longer serving, but yeah, 20 years, it's crazy. When you got there, it must have been a bit of a blank slate with, um, with new ideas that you could bring in, things to get rid of, like perhaps the Clive Tildesley commentary. That thought. was not down to me. Um, <laughs> for, for, uh, although Clive's a really nice bloke, He's it lovely. was still not down to me. That, that commentary, I don't know if anyone remembers it, it was on uh, the, the second game, and uh, it was essentially Tildesley saying, Liverpool, one, Manchester United, Neil, it was the most robotic, unlistenable thing. It got very dull very, very much quickly. Like nine nine. Anyway. <laughs> my my favourite was but always my... it was number nine passes the ball to number <laughs> ten because we couldn't go through the whole database and do recordings. We couldn't afford to do recordings, and that was only four thousand players. Imagine what it's like now. With what, what was the change you were most proud of? Your first big sweeping change that took the game on. Wow. The problem that, with asking me that question is I struggle to remember last week. So asking me about things from 20 years what, ago is what, difficult. What happened last week that was amazing? That has inadvertently made that first floppy disk game what it is today? What, that happened last week? Yeah, I but we'll just, really we'll just nice pretend it was 20 years. Week. That, that's what it was. It's you really a, tasty. You, you started off on the little floppy disk game, had some popcorn, and then 20 years later, here we are. The first eight years I was part-time. So the first eight years, I didn't even know that I was helping make a game. I thought I was just doing some research. But we did find some faxes recently because we've been doing some research for, for another little project that we've got, um, that we're working on at the moment. I found some faxes. And some of the ideas on there were really good and some of the ideas were really bad. But I'm actually going to save those to be revealed for the next project, if that's okay, that we're working on. Um, I can tell you of an idea that I came up with that didn't make it into the game which we wanted to throw an Easter egg. We were looking for Easter eggs to put out there. And just uh, in case anyone doesn't know, though, I suspect you all will, Easter eggs are hidden things in the game. Yeah, hidden things or things that happen rarely, like having a son in the game that then caused me loads of problems on Twitter. And uh, a suggestion came up in one of the feature meetings um, from me, and I hadn't even been drinking at this point of the day, that longer term in the game, you know, we want a little bit of variation. So why don't we have it that incredibly randomly and really rare, aliens could land on the Earth and they could have 30 for, for pace rather than 20. That is amazing. Why can't this... Can we get a patch for this? No. <laughs> so I went through this idea in the meeting and then turned around and went, no, that's ridiculous, we're not putting that in there. <laughs> so I do, I do tend to veto my own crazy ideas. I think you're insane, that's a great idea. Um, do you still play the game? I do, yeah. I mean, I, I direct the game, so I have to. And um, if any of our producers are here, I, I think they've all gone home. My, my normal thing on a Monday is to sit down with the production team and go through everything that I don't like about the game, which they, they don't particularly enjoy going through, because they then have to go and give the programmers the bad news. I, I chicken out doing it directly now. I used to do it all direct. But we've kind of got a do, do a ominous people. emails turn up that just say Miles doesn't like this. I don't know how they deal with it, but probably, or there'll be a little bit of a screenshot and go. We need to fix this. Miles doesn't like it. But um, so at this time of year in particular, I mean tonight is taking me away from from playing the game for eight hours. Um, which is what I would normally do. On I, a, on I think a, all of us in this room night. are in that boat. On a Monday night when I get home. Um, and yeah, this time of year I'm playing it constantly. And then when on the day that the game comes out, I start a career game with Watford on the same day that everyone else starts a career game with their favourite favorite team or the team they've decided to play with. Then I carry on playing that through till April or May time. 
and that's when I get the new build, the first build of the new game, and start playing on that. So um, I still play it a lot. I play FM handheld as well. Um, I tend to play sim mode, not classic. Um, over the last couple of years, of Collier, who is one of the founders, he now directs Football Manager Classic. Mark Vaughan directs Football Manager Handheld. I exec produce those two. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I love it. If, if, I didn't, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be directing it. We'd find someone else to do it. Because you can't, when you're working on something creatively, if you don't enjoy it, and if you can't get into, if you can't try at least and get into the mind of your audience and what your audience are gonna like. And we've got lots of people who play the game in different ways. So I have to try and think across the different ways that different people play it um, to try and have it as a cohesive thing at the end. But I'm also really lucky in that I've got an amazing team. We've just gone up over 100 people as of last week, which is phenomenal. Some of the team are, are here today as well. and. Um, just so lucky to get to do what we do for a living. You so know, it's, it's the, great. The question I think everyone wants to know is how far can this go? This, this is one of the longest running um, franchises, for want of a better word, of a game. It's probably been running just about as long as The Simpsons, and yet it hasn't gone shit like The Simpsons, <laughs> which is a massive bonus. Well, that's good. Um, how far can it go? Are there still more things you're looking sort of uh, way ahead that you can do with new, new technology? So, so we're not deliberately i made this clear on twitter that we're not talking about fm15 today because we've got a, a big announcement about that coming um in october um but this year's game you know last year we spoke about having over a thousand new features we've topped that and then some this year we've got about four four or five thousand ideas that haven't made it into a game yet so i've already done the basic the basic framework, the basic jigsaw puzzle for FM16 is done to the point that we might actually not have feature meetings this year. And we normally sit down for a month and go through all the new features that we want to add in. We might not do that this year because then we get an extra month making the game. But we've easily got enough for 16, 17 and 18 with things that are good and have gone through the process that people in the studio or like, because I don't decide everything that goes in the game. We sit down as a group and everyone is invited in the studio to those meetings to actually decide what goes in. And then as director, I put those jigsaw puzzle bits together. So much like a film would have a script writer and a, cin and a cinematographer and then a director, we work in that, in that same way. Um, but we've got enough for, uh, we've, we've got enough already for another three years and there are, probably about 1200 ideas that we haven't even looked at yet because so there you go none of us have to have real lives for at least three years with a possibility of extending that to another 10. it would be nice I mean, with, with the other stuff that we're doing as well away from the game of the prozone deal today a few other things that that we've got coming up we no longer see ourselves as a computer game company we're a football company um and the way that we're treated by people in football is as though we're a football company so so I expect we'll branch into other areas as well, but we want to continue making the game because without that, we don't have jobs. And, and there are lots of people here and lots of people out there who are watching it online who might have to go to the pub more often cause, <laughs> and, and become really skint because they're not sitting in playing the game instead. And uh, th this is a game, of course, which has been responsible for some horrendous bits of behaviour on the part of certainly me, um, uh, definitely Tony, and I'd imagine a, a number of you. You may be wondering, for example, why I'm the only one wearing a suit. It's because I have a cup final later and I want to be ready and right. I did actually, uh, just a couple of years ago, go the whole hog and put Abide With Me on Spotify. Um, I even stood up. Uh, uh, for that and then went on to win the cup final. Uh, a couple of days later I had another cup final, I didn't do any of that and I lost and there is a lesson there for all of us. Um, when we wrote Football Manager Stole My Life we, we w went around the country, we heard some terrifying stories. Uh, there were people shaking hands with the doorknob pretending that it was uh, Princess Michael of Kent. There was one man... Oh, we've all been though, there, though, right? <laughs> yeah, we've all done that. But maybe not that far. There was another guy who, uh, to simulate an away game in Turkey, set fire to his waste paper bin. I heard about this one. <laughs> <laughs> that just isn't safe. <laughs> 
But uh, Tony, you, uh, you've been deeper than most of us in this. Uh, a little well, what's bit. the weirdest thing you've done? Uh, the weirdest one, uh, well, I did, I've did. i done a couple. I did. Uh, I snuck out of a friend's wedding once uh, because it was getting a bit boring, and I went back <laughs> to the hotel terrible. room. I, transfer deadline was happening, so I was like, I need to go back. I knew the wedding was going to be fine. I needed another winger, right? So I was like, right, they'll be fine. I'll go back later. Uh, once, uh, I learnt the Cameroon national anthem for my ill-fated <laughs> 2018 can World you, Cup. Uh, can you uh, remember any of that? Cameroon, Bercy, Ode, Nos, and Centris, Vade, Bu, I don't know why I've done it to the tune of 500 miles by the Reclaimers, <laughs> but it just seemed... And then uh, the best, I think, the, well, I say the best, the most embarrassed I've ever been is when I once stood outside my bedroom because I was serving a touchline ban on the game <laughs> <laughs> but all of this is okay isn't it this is yeah. i mean miles will be beaming with pride yeah, here it's, because... it's great i mean my, my favorite story of these is actually jason manford's story where he was doing um he's a massive manchester city fan and he was doing their um their christmas party or end of season party one of the two and he took his dad along who his dad had always taken to city and jason was introduced to all the players and, and, and he said that it, according to his dad he was a bit off with micah richards and his dad said to him Yo, what's wrong with micah richards you know he's city through and through he play, plays always plays well and and Jason just went, oh, yeah, he didn't turn up for training the other day in Football Manager. <laughs> and it's when those things start happening, and they do affect it when, when I meet players as well, that there, there are players in the game that I love and then meet in real life and idolise them because of how they've been in Football Manager. I, um, it's they're, they're genuinely there are members of my family that I give less of a damn about than people who scored 25 goals for my South End team. Particularly the regens, right? Always, always the regens. Um, and Joe, always called Darren because my favourite it was Darren as well. You, yeah. you had a Darren, Derek, da oh, Derek, Derek, Derek. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I and I had one fella who he he wanted to go to Inter Milan so he can piss off. I'm not <laughs> Dar Darren was, was way better. Darren Anderson played uh, 140 times for England um, as a goalkeeper. He uh, started his career, went into goal for me at 17 and was a lifer at Watford all the way through his career. Uh, little Joey Proudfoot, five foot three with a tackling of 20. Nice. He was my guard dog. <laughs> so bit of a Yorkshire Terrier then. Absolutely, my, until he betrayed me. And we shall speak no more of that. Um, we've, uh, we've discussed comedy, we've discussed football manager. What we'd like to do now is to open this up to the audience and take questions. Uh, remember, you can ask questions to Tony, uh, to Miles, and even if you wanted to, you could ask questions to me. There are some people with microphones uh, maneuvering around. If you, there you are. So uh, don't be shy. Get in first because what usually happens is that no one asks a question for about five minutes and then in the last ten minutes it's a sea of hands. But if that happens, we can just go onto Twitter because there have probably been 20 or 30 people who've asked me stuff on Exactly, on we'll Twitter. just follow through. So, so don't let Twitter win, okay? We need questions from here. So we've got a question from the gentleman on the back row there. If you could just take the microphone. There you go. Um, I remember this year you opened up uh, Football Manager 2014 to the Steam Workshop. Uh, how's that been for you and have you taken any sort of features or ideas from that and put them into 2015? Um, it's great workshop. I love it. I mean, we've, we've always been very proud of our community. Um, I think, you know, I used to do data updates for, for the Championship Manager Series back in the day and a bunch of people that we worked with on those now have worked at the studio for nearly as long as I have. So the community are the lifeblood of what we do. Um, we actually don't like treading on the toes of the community that much. So if they're doing things that are on workshop, we'll leave them alone to, to let them carry on doing them on workshop. But certainly from a community perspective, um, we have a wish list thread on our forum and we tell people to post on there so that we can keep everything in one place. But we do go through all of those and a few hundred of the new features every year are things that are suggested from our forums and our user base. Um, one of the reasons that we do that is because we're all fans of the game as well, those of us who work on it. So why should we be the only people who get to come up with ideas? We want to listen to, to everyone who plays the game. Sometimes we disagree with them. 
Um, we are not going to put the ability for people to get married and have children and have dogs in the game or the ability for them to spend their wages on Ferraris or buy a football club or put money from their wages into the transfer fund. Because you know what? All that, right, Miles, that... don't embarrass me in front of all these people. <laughs> right? Because that does not happen in real life. So, Miles, it, so we want to keep keep to it being a simulation, but who cares whether they can buy a dog or not? Well, you're constantly asked, is there an option to run the club as, as the chairman? Will, will that ever happen? The game is called Football Manager. It's not called Football Chairman. There is a very good iOS game called Football Chairman, which is made by one of our researchers. By that, it's great fun. I'm about 100 odd seasons in. Um, it is really good fun, but that shows the level that you would be doing as a chairman so that you know it's not the deepest game in the world it's what i call a toilet game in the, in the you can go to the loo play it for five minutes you've got your fix go back to I, the I call the full version of football manager a toilet game you must sit on the toilet a lot. my wife doesn't respect me anymore <laughs> but you know so, so there are games out there that do that but we we want to concentrate on the the management and the coaching angles about a year ago you uh had a, an april fall i was disgusted with the fact that it was an April Fool, where you announced Football Manager 1888, complete with the original teams and players of the Football League, which I thought was amazing. Just imagine playing that for a couple of seasons, obviously dealing with Preston North End's dominance, and then more clubs coming in, the restructuring of the league, and you're there for the whole lot as real-life players develop. A teenage Dixie Dean emerges in your academy. Can you make that happen? No. Yeah, but the thing, is, the, thing is, though, the thing is, though, what would have happened if he'd done that? Then there would have been sort of thing going, oh, yeah, but what if world wars happen? And Miles would go, no, it's not realistic. We <laughs> I can't know, have I world know, wars. I know, I know, I know. We would have been <laughs> world wars were covered. Relic, our sister studio, they make games about world wars. Yeah, you we could just have just had it. for a bit. We, we could have just had it so that when, when it comes to, to the first world war, you're then playing that campaign through in Company of Heroes <laughs> rather, rather than playing Football Manager. But uh, uh, which is a really good game. But the problem with it is one, you'd know who all the good players are, and two, oh, from 1874. <laughs> no, but, but when <laughs> for eight, 1888. But, 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 but when you get to the 1950s, everyone's just going to be trying to sign a 16-year-old Pele, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. So um, but yeah, it was it was a really good idea that people took far too seriously. Um, but it was brilliant that the Football League retweeted it about a minute after we sent it out. Um, and they they had actually approved some of the screenshots, but the the work that was done on it by the comms team in our place, you know, they they did it well. The screenshots with spiffing in there and various other football terms and and general terms from the from the late 1800s. If, if anyone out there in the Games Workshop wants to put that together, I will publicise it more than the birth of my first child. <laughs> so it will happen. There's a gentleman at the back there who's right in between the people with the microphones. There's one coming down from the right. So I will slowly and professionally fill until that microphone reaches him by saying, if you do want to ask a question while we're discussing the other one, wink flirtatiously at me or show a nipple. You, sir, you show a nipple. They look good. You, sir, at the back. Um, just, just a random question, really, basically. With, with the Prozo now, would you um, ever consider putting into a women's, women's league into it in the in section in future future games? I've, I've been asked this quite a few times before on, on Twitter and very clear about it. We'd love to make a game that includes women's football, but at the moment it's just not commercially viable. It's not just about the data. You've also got to do all the player models. You've got to do all, redo all the animations. The game is played differently. The financial model is slightly different. So what I've said on there, and I, I'm saying this on camera now, so I can't get away with anything. When there are 10 women's leagues around the world that have similar attendances to the championship, that's the time that it's commercially viable. That's the time we'll look to do it. But I watch women's football and you know it's improving massively so fast. Um, so hopefully one day we can do it. But it just, then it needs to be commercially viable where the reality is that we're not, we're not a massive conglomerate of a company, we, we need to make profits for, for Sonic the Hedgehog, otherwise, otherwise he gets upset. So, but at, at some point, I hope we'll do it. Sir, in the front row. Basically, um, was there any, just a question about the history of Championship Manager, Football Manager, was there any point where you realised it was actually going to be as big as it is now, rather like a turning point or like for Championship 
manager 97, 98, you know, any kind of time like that? Or so, so the way that we used to run the business was we had a team of people, we knew how much money we had coming in for the advances for the game that we made, and then we'd get royalties. And once we got those royalties, we'd hire more people because we knew we could definitely pay them. It wasn't exactly the most business-focused organization in the world. So we've, always, we've just got on with it. I mean, it, because me of Paul, Woods, Duffy, Sven, Vaughney, you know, the people who were there in the early days, Kev Turner as well, we've all grown up together. So it's never been, there's never been a decision of this year we need to sell this many copies of the game. It's always, we're just going to make the best game that we can. Um, Sega will sit there and go through budgets and say, this year we're going to sell this many copies. And it's like, fine, that's, that's our target. But we, we never decided that it was going to be big. You know, Paul had his band. Ov went off traveling. I had another job. It, it was like being in a band that didn't go on tour for the first few years. And then as it got busier and busier, we realized we had to spend more and more time doing it. But if, if someone had asked us eight years ago when we became part of Sega, if someone had said, you're going to have 100 members of staff and have you know, 26 weeks, 24 weeks, 26 weeks at number one in the UK, whatever it was this year, we'd have just laughed and said, whatever. And, and it is, we keep on just making the best game we can possibly make. And we believe that the success will keep happening if we do that. So there's no big plan to be the biggest company in the world. We just want to make games... I want to make games that I enjoy, so I don't know about the rest of the team, but I think it's the same for all of us. We just want to make games that we enjoy, and there are loads of people out there who enjoy them as well. That's awesome. The uh, gentleman in the centre. Uh, hi, guys. Um, when you're playing Football Manager, everyone always talks about the happy memories, the times, those regens who really make your career. But I'm also thinking about the times when you just sink into utter despondency, such as when my Wolfsburg team, 1-0 up, Europa League final, Javier Pastore from Palermo, two goals, just broke my heart broke my heart because I've been building that team for ages. I was wondering, what is the moment in the game that has most shattered your tiny little hearts? We're, we're here for you, friend. Uh, Tony, this one to you. 2037, it was. Um, Mine's 2032, so we're on, we're on the yeah, same, same 2037, I was, I was flying. I was absolutely flying. Uh, Blythe Spartans were my team. Um, they, were, they were incredible. Uh, Europe, uh, we were up in the higher echelons of the Premier League. Um, things were going well. We are about to get that first illustrious um, Champions League spot. And it was all looking fine and brilliant. It's tailed off slightly. The squad wasn't really big enough, to be honest. I couldn't really invest much more in January. And then, uh, so we did start to tail off a little bit. Injuries happened. Derek Reynolds, he was just coming in as a little 15 year old in the thing. I'm going, oh, he's going to be brilliant, right? He's not ready to blood in just yet. And we had three games to, uh, to, to do it, to be honest, to get into that, that, that top four spot. And we played, uh, because of the way the fixtures had backed up, I had uh, Liverpool twice and Everton sandwiched between them. And uh, basically, I lost all three games. Uh, my wife's a Liverpool fan, so I didn't speak to her for two days afterwards. Uh, and then, uh, and then I was just sitting there, just I just I couldn't believe it. I was about to, I was I was actually considering resigning just because I didn't think that we'd got in the champion. I went that the, the people of Blythe will be really really unhappy now. And it's it's only a little fishing village up in the northeast <laughs> that, that I've no idea. And I was just like, nah, I've taken them as far as I can go. And then the next season we actually went and we actually won the league. So I'd, uh, and that that gave the lads. The, the kick that they really needed so uh, I, I still, I still have, have, a, have a hatred for, for Liverpool and Everton in that game They're, Liverpool actually got relegated two seasons later ha! How many how many seasons deep are you into this game? I'm now 50 years in <laughs> I'm 85 on the game and I was considering this is on, on FM 10 by the way um, so I've still got my laptop's about to die and I'm like going I need to just keep this one going because like that's where it is and that's where the magic is um, and I'm, I'm, I'm 85 at the minute I was considering uh, resigning and retiring and going you know time to spend time with the grandkids apparently I've had girls uh, and I was going I'm gonna I'm gonna do it that's me I'm just gonna cut me ties and then I had two 15-year-old midfielders came into the youth system who look amazing. So I think I might hang on for a little bit and because uh, I'm sure they've found the cure for living by that point. So be all right. You don't, you don't age anymore when you get to 100 in the game anyway. You just oh, stay, right, stay at 100 yeah, forever. In, in my internal monologue, though, when I'm interviewing myself, like I've, I've, put, I've got like a really croaky voice now. 
<laughs> do, you, do you forget stuff? Do you like make tactical changes, but it turns out you never really did and you've been talking to a plant pot? <laughs> There's a couple of times when I've been borderline racist to myself, if that's what you mean. <laughs> Miles, <laughs> your rock bottom. 2032. I mean, this this is a nice rock bottom to have. 2032, I'd won six trophies in the season as Watford, Champions League final, and got absolutely hammered in the Champions League final. It was a 5 0 win. And I'd been in the last three years' Champions League finals and hadn't won any of them and just didn't know what I was going to do and didn't play the game for three days. And then, I, uh... then came back to it. I, I have two. The, the first very recent, um, as a South End fan, it felt wrong to replace Steve Tilson at South End for several years because what could I do more than Steve Tilson had done with two back-to-back -back promotions playing beautiful football? It'd be sacrilege to do it. So when he was eventually and cruelly sacked, I played as South End in uh, an effort to avenge him and was sacked inside, I think, 14 games, which was pretty heartbreaking. But then there was the moment which I know everybody in this room has had. You only do it once where you go to the pub, you fall into conversation about this football manager game, you're really enjoying the conversation, so much so the drinks are flowing, you go home, you think I should go to bed, but I'll just check on that team first, and you wake up the next morning and you've sold everybody, signed a whole load of crap Brazilians, and everything has fallen apart and you that, cannot fix it. Is that the tactic that Southampton are employing currently at the minute? <laughs> That story is why you should all stay at home playing football manager all the time rather than going to the pub. <laughs> the quest Perfect for example. dominance begins here. Um, sir, you had a question over there. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, you had a, a brief flirtation with the, uh, with the consoles, the Xbox, um, for a couple of years. What brought that about? What brought down the downfall? And are there any plans to go uh, on the next-gen consoles? Um, what brought about doing it in the first place is that um, someone gave us money if we do it. Um, so it didn't cost us anything to do, which is the way that console, consoles often work. I'm, I'm avoiding the gaze from the, the <laughs> evil looks that I'm now getting from the PR for saying that. Um, what killed it off was that the control system and the user interface weren't good enough. And unfortunately... Connect didn't exist in that time, and even if it did, you would have just been waving your hands at the screen like that, which would have been no good. It was just too difficult for people to control. It wasn't enjoyable, it wasn't good enough, or the quality that we expected. So when the sales dipped down to a point that other people agreed with us as well, we stopped doing it. Um, whether we come back to it in the future, at the moment we've got no plans, that doesn't mean we won't ever do it. We might have a breakthrough with the way that we can do the interface with consoles but um but at the moment you know we've got touch screens now and, and you know it's a, a genuine thank you to apple for giving us the iphone and and um and the tablet thing the ipad <laughs> um in in the first place so that we could deliver games to people who don't have powerful enough pcs to play it at home um, so certainly that's a very important part of our plans, whereas consoles are on the back burner because we've got other things that we'd rather do at the moment. Uh, and on that note, uh, Tony's rider for tonight's show is a MacBook Pro, uh, just for any Apple staff listening. Shop soiled is fine. Yeah, it's that's no fine. issue. It, it needs to have a disk drive because that FM10 game's on a disk, so... Uh, we've got another question over here. Your question, sir. Sure. Um, Ian, just want to apologise for almost sending you to Covent Garden earlier today. <laughs> <That was me. laughs> it's you. That was me. I, I got a message on Twitter saying uh, I'm, I'm off to Covent Garden I, uh, Apple Store to see the Football Manager show. And I thought, oh, Jesus, I thought it was Regent Street. That would have been a disaster. But I, I did talk sport earlier. And I was on there. And Luke Wright, the England cricketer who we know he plays, plays FM, he, um, he was meant to be on the show as well. And I tweeted him just saying, Luke, so what time are you on? Are we going to bump into each other and he went, I know absolutely nothing about this. So if they did do an interview with Luke, it would have had to be a phone interview because he was at some under 15s game today. So it happens, people get confused. But we got there in the end. Your question, sir. Um, yes, for Miles. Um, this year you released um, Foot Magic Classic on the Vita. Just want to know from your perspective how that has gone, if we're going to be repeating out in the future, future versions of the classic game account on Vita. The honest answer is we don't know yet. Um, we haven't reached the threshold that we need to to do another one at the moment. It's still ticking on. If it gets a boost in the next month or so, then maybe. But it, it's not looking likely at the moment, unfortunately.
But we'd love to do another one. But we need people to buy it. Otherwise, we can't afford to do it. So, so that's, that's where we're at on that. Uh, we've got another question. It's coming from the back of the audience with the uh, young gentleman there. I believe the microphone is working its way. That's the stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a chance of Premier League licensing coming in the near future? <laughs> Electronic Arts signed a new deal with the Premier League last week for five years. So not for the next five years. We knew nothing about the negotiation going on. So, um, so yeah, unfortunately not at this stage. I don't want to see their smiling faces on my screen anyway. Whereas There's, I do. Do you? I'd, I'd love to have a licence, yeah. They're all so shiny. I was Real Madrid very briefly and I didn't like Ronaldo's shiny face. Well, we'll, we'll just send out all the local newspapers to take the photos rather than... Uh, rather than taken direct from the FA. Uh, there's the another League, voice yeah. from the crowd there. You, sir. Uh, Miles, you don't employ designers at your studio. Um, I wanted to know what are the reasons for that and how do you do design? What are the advantages of not having designers? Everyone who works in our studio is a designer. Whether that be the office manager through the marketing team, the PR team, we all play the game. We all want to design features. Um, so that's why we've gone for the model that is the director, game director rather than designer. So I will look through all the ideas that have passed through the feature meetings and make a decision on what works well together, put that jigsaw puzzle together, and that becomes the game. Um, there are some amazing game designers out there, so I'm not, not dis but, you know, dismissing any of their work at all. Um, there are some phenomenal visionaries out there. In our case, we have 100 people who play the game and all want to have their input, and we love that. And it was just a decision that we made in the very, very, very early days, with Ov and Paul both being programmers, me being more on the business side, but all of us got involved on the design. And, you know, long may it continue with, with the new people who joined, a couple of them are down here. I'm looking forward to getting their ideas for, for future games as well. So um, I think if you don't listen to that feedback, you're not going to have the best experience. When you're creating stories and specifically scripted stories, then you need a designer to be there when you're creating levels like in call of duty you need a designer to be there to create those levels our game is completely open world you can play the game any way that you want to do anything that you want in there apart from buying ferraris and houses and and uh marrying but you know you can do anything you want so so that's why we've gone down that route uh, another question from the back there you're right. Um, I was just wondering, what's the weirdest thing or the weirdest managerial appointment you've ever seen? Because my mind jumps to 2031 when North Ferriby United appointed Jakob Blaszczykowski with Ryan Hall as the assistant manager. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering, what's the, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen? Are, are you talking in game or in real life? Uh, in game. In real game. life. Well, let's go back to Alan Irving. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he's going to do a very good job. Um, I've seen um, I've seen Peter Crouch and Rio Ferdinand have both been England manager. Um, I don't quite understand that. I think it didn't work out very well. Uh, strangely, um, yeah, I think they're the, they're the first ones that jump straight to my mind. I, I actually saw Gareth Southgate replace Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United after a blistering spell with Arbroath, which I didn't <laughs> understand at all. Whereas Wayne Wayne Rooney actually left the job as assistant manager for me as a, at Watford to take over at Luton. That was, that was a wow. bit strange. I'll tell, I tell you what else I've seen as well that was quite weird. Um, Real Madrid eventually end up playing in the Modric Arena as well, which is nice. quite nice. Well, yeah. you know, he's going to be a legend there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, one at the back over there. Yeah, I know I can't ask about um, FM the 15 other one. You, you can You can ask about anything, I just won't tell you anything. Uh, well, I guess I'll ask the opposite, which is, what would you absolutely love to be in FM, but just impossible and viable at the moment? He's what would you dream smart. of FM being? I like this. What would we like to see in the series that hasn't been possible in yeah, the past? Yeah, it's still impossible. Like, what won't be in there, but you'd love it to be? Spaceships. <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 al the alien feature. The more, the more I talk about that, the more I like it. Um... We're making strides towards where we want to go with this, but you know, we want the game to look like a real game of football. We're not interested in having computery style graphics and, and cheating on those levels or, or having players' hair being wavy. That's not what we want. What we want is a real game of football. And it's something that we started on very late. 
when it comes to the three with the three D side of things. But it's an area that we've been concentrating on expanding, um, and I'm hopeful that people will will see differences in FM fifteen to fourteen, and that those differences will continue, because it's for me the on, the only time that I feel a sense of disbelief and falling away from the universe is actually when I'm watching the matches and I see a bad animation or I see a player sliding. It makes it unbelievable. We, we really want, I, I want people to have an escape. Football Manager is an escape for people from their normal lives to be able to go in and do something, do a fantasy without it being dangerous. Um, so I'd like to see that improve. But the thing is that everyone in the studio will have different answers to that question. And, and that's, that's the beauty of what we do. So people will fight very hard to get other people in the studio behind them on the ideas that they love. And that, again, is why we don't have designers, is because everyone, everyone wants to get involved and everyone pushes things, to, things forward. We are coming close to the end now, so if you've got Ooh. any questions, now's the time. Uh, can can I just make an apology? Okay, of course. First, before we go to the next question. The last time that I saw an event at the Apple Store was, um, I actually saw REM playing here, which was utterly amazing. And the friend of mine who brought me along is a concert promoter, so we had reserved seats, and they weren't filming it, so we had reserved seats at the front. And Michael Stipe... I, I don't know whether he's, he's bad at remembering, but he had handwritten lyrics for every song and was handing them out every time they were being given to me. And there were people there who'd queued up for hours, all right, to get a good seat. So I was just handing these lyric sheets back to them. And he kept on handing them to me, and I kept handing them back to other people. And at the end of the gig, one of their road crew came up to me, and he'd signed two bits of pita bread with Michael Stipe, and I got given those, and one of them stood in my freezer. And what we wanted to do tonight, what we wanted to do and what we tried to do is Tom went out in the rain when it was pouring down earlier, went up to the shops, got some little pancakes, because I, I like pancakes, and we tried to sign some pancakes to give them out, but unfortunately, it just doesn't work. So the moral of the story is, one, we tried to do something good. We apologise that we haven't. The second is don't try writing on Marks and Spencer's pancakes because it just doesn't work well. It's a fool's errand, a fool's errand. They need are to there, fix them. Are there any more questions at all? Is there, is there one from Kieran back there? Kieran, I know you can't get the microphone to you, but you wanted to ask, is there a novel loosely based on Football Manager coming out in the near future? I'm really glad you asked that. There is a novel loosely based on Football Manager, uh, which will be coming out. Who's written it? Well, it's someone very, very close to me. It will... <laughs> If you're familiar with the stories of Bobby Manager in The Blizzard, um, it's actually being published by The Blizzard. It's a, a sort of football manager loosely linked uh, novel with what I would say is an awful lot of sex, but is actually an awful lot of people trying and failing to have sex. I don't want you to read too much into me over this. Um, it, it, it's not me in the book, and it is out next month, and I'm really glad that I was uh, given the opportunity to answer that. Finally, final call for any more questions. There's one, one over there. Just behind you. Oh, sorry, missed you. Hi. Um, created a f creative assembly of a often known for the Total War franchise, as I start to create the Alien Isolation game right now. Um, my question is: uh, Have you ever wanted to spread your wings and create a game of a different genre than rather than foot management? Well, for a start, Alien Isolation has the best lighting of any video game I've ever seen ever, and it is genuinely scary. I can stand watching someone playing the game without the sound on and still get scared. So you know they're they're doing amazing work on it, but they actually formed a new team to work on that. It's it's you know Mike Simpson is still working on the Total War series. Um, We've done hockey in the past, we've done baseball in the past and, and other sports. But it's, it's a weird thing for us. So I don't think, personally, I don't think I'm capable of making another style of game. And we're told we're quite good at this. Our review scores say we're quite good at it. The sales say we're quite good at it. So I'm just going to stick to what we know in, in the same way as I know a lot of musicians because I worked in the music industry back in, back in the day. <laughs> and we still have a lot of musicians who play the game now. You're not going to see a band, a rock band, going off and making a techno album and doing it really successfully. So for, from my perspective, I don't know what the rest of the guys in the studio think, but... We're all pretty happy making 
FM, sticking to making FM. Uh, Tip Tipo wants to make a racing game, but we can't make uh, can't get those licenses. So, well, whichever sorry, game Simon you make, do I have to adjust my routine for it as well? Yeah, you're, you're going to do Peppa Pig ruined my life. Brilliant. Okay, that's cool. Well, it only remains for me to thank the wonderful people at the Apple Store here on uh, Regent Street by their products. They're very, very good. Um, thank you Especially so much. Especially MacBook Pros. MacBook Pros, shop soiled or not, always a welcome home here. Thank you so much to everyone for braving the rain and coming out to uh, listen to us ramble on. And thank you to Miles Jacobson, Studio Director of Sports Interactive. And, of course, to Tony Jameson, who will be on tour absolutely everywhere. And thank you to everyone who turned up tonight. It really does mean a lot that this amount of people came out on a Monday night in the pouring down rain just to come and hear us talk really does mean a lot. Um, we're probably going to a pub around the corner, so if you hang around outside, we can always carry this on over there. If there's a pub big enough, please come and join us for a drink. We're not paying, but come and join us for a drink. <laughs> you had them right up until that moment. Thank you very much, everyone. So, just to, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Recruiter is an incredibly powerful piece of software that utilizes the stats game from games to create a kind of, uh, it, it enables you to look for players directly according to attributes. It's a bit like doing a player search in FM. You go on there as a, as a real life manager and you copy down Troy Deeney's stats and say, I want to find a player who's like Troy Deeney. Who doesn't? Uh, yeah, exactly. And there's uh, no player like Troy. Well, Dino. obviously with Troy, he's irreplaceable. Of course, but, of course. But if you were doing it with with Belkalem, who we've just loaned to a Turkish team, then you can do you can do the same thing with him and, and find someone who who is similar. And they've had recruiter working for a while, but they've had it from the position of previous stats, so just real, just real life match data. But with our systems as well, they've got a load more information because they've. They're getting injury history, they're getting contract info, but also how we think the players are going to do in the future. Um, and whereas our database is 500, and at the moment, as of yesterday when I last checked, with 583,000 players and staff from around the world. That's the same that QPR had when they got relegated from the <laughs> Premier League. It's, it, that's true. Um, with Recruiter, we've got 80,000 players, but they've also got video clips in there. So it's not just the agents sending video clips. Someone can go in and do that player search and end up with a video of the player, their stats from them, their stats from us, and then decide whether they're going to send a scout to go and see them or not. It's not, it's not like that sort of that archetypal YouTube compilation, is it? Where they make it look like quite decent. They've got some heavy dance track in the background and then just ends with Jimmy Triore just falling over. And then... I, 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 was, I was asked this earlier. I, I did a few radio interviews today and I was asked that earlier and, and did point out that even though my quality is not really World Cup, it's not even good enough for Sunday League as a footballer, I'm sure someone could put a video together of me looking good. And then on the way back to the office from doing that interview, one of my mates who played, for, played with me for the Watford Internet supporters team went, no, mate, there's no chance <laughs> it would have been a video. So, so it isn't possible to make everyone look good at football in a video, but so most people, yes. The question that everyone's were going to ask, particularly people who uh, are a little dismissive of Football Manager, the bastards, is, um, th is this going to replace scouting? Well, it's not going to replace scouting. It's just going to be another resource for scouts. You know, no manager should ever sign a footballer without having watched them first. I don't care if their chief scout has seen them. Spending £10 million on a footballer Alan Irving, where you, haven't, looking where at you. you haven't watched them <laughs> is, I find, a little bit strange. But... Um, but yeah, at least send the head scout out to see them. So no one should be using the data and just deciding to buy them off that. No one should do a Bebe. Look what happened with him. Can we, um, can we know who's using it? What, what kind of clubs are using this software? Um, there are a lot of clubs in the Premier League and top European divisions, but Prozone keep that quite close to their chest of exactly who's using it. But a lot. It's is quite there, scary, actually, how many people are using it. Is there anywhere we can see? Maybe, maybe a screenshot, perhaps? Ah, maybe a screenshot. Here's one we prepared earlier. Um, if you go to our Facebook page, because you're not going to be able to see this properly from here, but we do have uh, some screenshots of, of what the recruiter system looks like. 
unfortunately, um, the logins are really expensive, like football. Very difficult to log off Football Manager at any point. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Tonight we are obviously going to talk about Football Manager. We're also going to talk about stand-up comedy. But before we talk about that, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters unified in our devotion to a computer game that was once dismissed as a glorified bloody spreadsheet but that we know to our cost is so much more and this is a proud day for the likes of you and me for this is a day that football manager has announced a groundbreaking link up with the good people at prozone and you may have heard about this in the news but for more directly from the horse's mouth miles what's happened um well, life imitating art, imitating life, which Kieran doesn't like me saying, but I'm, I'm going to keep saying it anyway. Um, we've been working with originally a company called Amisco, who were like Prozone, but no, no one's ever heard of them before. Um, they were a French company who provided loads of stats to clubs and kept themselves very much under the radar. And we've been working with them for a few years because we used to license their tech to help us make our match engine. Because what better way to be making the match engine better if we're actually watching real life games in 2D and 3D more graphically rather than the actual TV footage. Um, and we were getting on very well with them and then they turned around to us one day and said that they were merging with a company called Prozone, had we heard of them? And it's like, well, yeah. And they went, well, we want you to be part of it as well. And rather than um, just having their, the main product that they have, they were looking at putting together a product called Recruiter, which is a scouting tool, which is with the same clubs that they provide other data to as well. And they wanted to license our data for it. And, um, and that's happened. Hello. Um I'm not Ed Malian. Uh, Ed Malian was supposed to present this today, but uh, I'm very much afraid that Ed Malian is unwell. So I will be taking over hosting duties tonight. If at any point it seems like I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, it is because I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, and that's how it's going to come across. I will be referring to notes, which looks awful, like a best man who hasn't prepared, but uh, bear with me, we're all going to get through this. So, um, to reiterate, I'm Ian McIntosh. I'm the co-author of the book Football Manager Stole My Life, which you may have seen. Melvin Bragg described it as slightly better than Anthea Turner's autobiography, but only just. Just. I'm joined by two fantastic guests today. Um, first of all, coming onto the stage is the man who propelled Football Manager from the stuffy bedroom of the Collier Brothers to its lofty perch at the top of the gaming industry. He's one of the co-founders of Games Aid. He works with Warchild, BAFTA, Nordoff Robbins and Special Effect. He's got a column in the mirror. He's got an actual bloody OBE. He's the studio director of Sports Interactive and he is Mr. Miles Jacobson. Don't clap yet because he's joined by someone just as wonderful. It's the man who turned his football manager problem into a football manager solution with the hit stand-up comedy show Football Manager Ruined My Life, which I have seen and I can testify is absolutely brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miles Jacobson and Tony Jameson. Hello. Hello. Thanks Hello for joining me. Hello, everyone. Hello. And thanks to everyone else for, for joining me. I, I know the weather has been appalling, and uh, it's also very... All club expensive, so I don't expect anyone here to be to be able to get a login. I, I still want one for myself anyway. And if you go to our Facebook page, you can at least see some screenshots of it. So you've been, uh, you've been all over the media today talking about this. What's the reaction been in general? To me or to the, to to, the product? To, to the idea. <laughs> um, Everyone's been really positive, which a few years ago we announced that we had a deal with Everton and we went round the media at that time and I, I did an interview for the World Service where the interviewer said to me, um, you know, but you're just a bunch of kids, right? You've never played football before, you've never played football at a high level and you've got all these people around the world who are also kids who haven't played football providing all this research. So why have Everton license your data you know it's stupid right because you guys don't know anything about football to which my response was well that's odd because I used to live listen to your commentary when I was growing up and that's how I learned quite a lot about football at which point you just said touche <laughs> but I think nowadays things have changed because so many people in the media have grown up playing the game and yourself included um, so I feel really old actually saying that <laughs> 
I'm not that old. But but there are lots of people in the media who've who've grown up playing it, and loads of people who blog about football who who've become really interested in the st in the statistical side of the game, off the back of the game. So everyone's been taking it incredibly seriously and just yeah, well this makes total sense to do rather than the negativity from a few years ago. Fantastic. Well, from football manager becoming more like real life to football manager ruining my life, uh, Tony, uh, as I said in the introduction, is, uh, is a stand-up comedian who's made his name with a show about his addiction to football manager. Tony, you must...